darkness. Pray for everyone here and those that are watching by way of internet. The same light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ flood their heart. Jesus is magnifying the cause of this teaching. No ambiguity, no gray areas. Everything will be so simple. In Jesus' name we pray. Our text is Hebrews and chapter 1, reading from 1 to 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, or manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet. We say God spoke in time past to the fathers using the vehicles of the prophet. The Bible says, had in these last days spoken unto us by son. The word his is in italics. That's to say, how God speaks today, he speaks in his son. So the voice of God on earth is the voice of his son. The voice of Jesus. Not the voice of the prophets. Not the voice of the fathers. But the voice of his son. The Bible says, whom he had appointed heir of all things. So what are the all things? All things spoken by the prophets to the fathers. Jesus was the inheritor of those things. By whom, talking about Jesus, also he made the words. Take note of the word words there. It's in plural. That's like the words, the word of Abel, the word of Noah, the word of Enoch, the word of Abraham. All of these different dispensations, if you please. These were the things he fulfilled. At the words. Next verse, verse 3. Verse 3. Who being the brightness, the word brightness, the effulgence of his glory, and the express image, the character, the Greek word calls it the character, the exact copy, the f- photocopy, the best picture God took of himself was Jesus. And upholding all things by the word of his power. Again, what is the word of God's power? When he had by himself Forge our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So God's power will be seen where? In the purging of our sins. So help me say God is powerful in the purging of our sins. Help me look at your neighbor and say God is powerless in killing any human being. It is not in his character to kill. No, how do I know? Because when Jesus walked the earth, because Jesus is the express image, it means that the prophet and the fathers were not the express image. We never saw Jesus killing anybody. True? You remember Luke 9.51 when they were to kill, call down fire. Should we examine that? Yeah, we don't just want to gloss over anything. Luke 9, 51. Quickly, we are doing this to help us. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. You didn't hear me. The owner of the word was not received in the world that he came to because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And the Bible says, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, hey, Lord, we doubt that we call, command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did. The next verse. But he turned and rebuked them the way you rebuke a devil. Rebuke them and say, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. It means the manner of spirit with which Elijah called down fire was not of God. Because that's why he rebuked his disciples. Because you have a different spirit. The spirit of Christ is not the spirit, spirit of calling fire to keep people. Now look at what he did. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's life. Now if for nothing, you are hearing this from Jesus. He did not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another... So, Jesus will put up with man until man comes to terms with his purpose. Jesus did not kill them. Jesus instead redirected. Now that's to say, Elijah would have used another route instead of calling fire down. No, you didn't hear what I just said. Now if Jesus could take another route, Elijah would have simply said, Samaritan, you didn't receive me, let me go another way. Instead of trying to prove power, 
Jesus is the express image of God. He purged our sins. And he said that he didn't come to destroy. Second Peter in chapter 3 verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9. Thank you Jesus. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9. He said, the Lord, join me to read, the Lord is not slack concerning, all right, read on, uh -huh. but is long-suffering to us, what? not willing, not willing, not willing, but to do all, come, come to the null, to come to repentance. God is never interested in killing. He never destroyed. He will never do it. And he, is, he has never done it. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 3, 4 and 5. I want to explain this to you. What we will find God doing is the purging of sins. Look at what he said. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who we have and to come to the knowledge of service. Now, God does not want anybody destroyed, but God will want everyone saved. So it is safe to say that God is not a destroyer. It's safe to say God is not a killer. Because you wouldn't kill the same people you, were, you died for. And the Bible says God Never count slackness like men would do. He's not willing that any should perish. So we will see God on the side of purging our sin. I'd like to throw some light into some of the things we did on Thursday. And we asked a question, who killed Pharaoh? Did we ask that question? We found out that unbelief killed Pharaoh. Did we find that out? Okay, let's do that. Hebrews and chapter 11. Hebrews and chapter 11. We did that on Thursday, but you get the tape or you go to the internet and get it. Hebrews chapter 11. Glory be to God forever. Verse 29. Verse 29. Now, it said, by faith, who were the people that passed through the Red Sea? The Israelites, isn't it? Now, notice. And as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying, the word are saying is attempting. They were attempting. You don't attempt faith. You know it. So they walked in unbelief. That's why they attempted. Are saying to do, we are drowned. So what drowned them? Faith or unbelief? Now we'll use two different rendering. There was a particular rendering we used on Thursday that used unbelief. So put it there. Put it there first. Now we will deal with a lot of things. Leave it there. Now he said, by an act of faith, Israel walked through the Red Sea on a dry ground. The Egyptian tried it. Now, you don't try faith. Faith is what you know, isn't it? So they walked in unbelief. They drowned. So what drowned Pharaoh and his people was not God. Because God is never a killer. It was the unbelief of Pharaoh and his people that drowned them. God's mercy. I think I have a scripture to that. Please remind me in Psalm 136. But let's look at the next word. Thank you. It said, it was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But the Egyptians tried to follow. There's a rendering we had on Thursday that used the word, they acted in unbelief and they got drowned. All we have been studying, even with the motion of sin, you now discover that man's greatest challenge has always been unbelief or disobedience to the word of God. The story and the account of Egypt was an account of unbelief. And the church must come to know that. Instead of acting drama and replacing the drama and replacing it with other things instead of projecting unbelief. Am I communicating? Everybody say next verse. Say next verse. So who destroyed Jericho? Who destroyed Jericho? It was faith that made the walls of Jericho fell down after the Israelites had marched around them for you now take the note of the next word by faith. Console, next. Okay, let's try this. It was faith that kept the prostitute. Where was the prostitute? She was inside. 
If, and you know, it was not only Rahab, Rahab and Ahasud. So they heard the message, they believed the message, and so when the people who acted in faith came, those who were in unbelief died. Am I communicating? Rahab was not just saved, she and her house. So there must have been a message they heard for which they exercised their faith, for which they lived above the destruction. Look at it. He said, by faith, they had lot. Can you imagine the description? Had lot. So it was not her deeds, it was her faith. It was not an action, it was her faith. It means others in that place could have had faith and would have been able to overcome. God was never behind it. He said, by faith, the heart of Rahab perished not with them. Who are the them that believe not? So the people who perish, what were they? Give me another rendering of this. I love this. I think I've gotten what I'm looking for. So I need you to understand this. He said, an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho, in case you were still in doubt, she was a renowned professional. A Jericho harlot. I didn't say so. Welcome the spies and escape the destruction that came unto those who refused. So what was the destruction? God or their unbelief? Unbelief. Now this will offend religious mind. And in case I offend your religious sensibility, just forgive me because we are learning together. There was a time we believed God did all of those things. But a careful study of the word of God, you find out that almost all the things they accused God of, God was never involved. God is a one laner. God is light. In him is no darkness. Come on, you didn't hear what I just said. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 5, explains the side on which God is. 1 John 1, 5, please, you, I will come back to all of this. But I'm throwing this seed to create something in your heart. To understand that the power of God will be seen in the purging of sins. And men are to believe in what God has done for them. It is that belief that brings them to faith. Everyone who has believed the gospel of Jesus has been brought to faith. He is not looking for faith. He is not void of faith. He is in the faith. And by that faith, there is nothing you cannot overcome. Glory be to God. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you what is the message? And so what would darkness mean? Negativity. Activities of the devil. You know, like I said on Thursday, there are a group of people who believe Satan is the testing hand of God. If God wants to prove anything in your heart, to know if you have followed him very well, he will say, Satan, go and touch. Let me check. The same way Job was doing. The same temptation Job went through. Job said, the things I greatly feared has come upon me. Was God involved in the temptation of Job? No. Because in James, James put up a defense on that. James 1.14. He puts up a defense. Come on, somebody. Are we in church? Where did I quote? Verse 13. 13. 13. Everybody read with me. One to go. Let no man say when he is tempted. For God. Neither. Has God ever been involved in it? No. No. God is not involved. What God will be found doing is that God will die for the sins of man. Romans 5, 8, 9, and 10. See how he did it. See how he did it. So when we talk about the justice of God, you see, I'm putting up a defense to who God is. That God cannot be on the side of what men term God to be. The justice of God will be found that he, God, will die for man. So that man can be liberated from the shackles of the devil. But God, who commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners. What did he do? 
Now look at the next verse. And we'll, verse 10 will really interest you. But let me read 9. But verse 10, I want you to be involved. Much more than. So much more than this. Being now justified by his blood. In the purging of our sins. We shall be saved. There is a wrath to come. But believing in what he has done. We shall be saved from the wrath to come. Everybody read one to go. For if. Read it again. For if. Those of you at the back. For if when we were, what were we? He killed us. What did he do? We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So God dies for his enemies. God does not kill his enemies. We were enemies. He died for enemies. You didn't hear what I just said. God did not kill his enemies. When we were, not when we were planning, we were, God died for his enemies. He said, for when we were enemies, we were reconciled. And the reconciliation was initiated by God. By, by uh, reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So the purpose of him purging our sins is for us to receive his life. Somebody is not in church today. Am I communicating? Let me give you some. I told you to allow me one scripture today. Psalm 136, isn't it? Let's look at that. Look, let's look, it, look at it. You know, because there are funny things I've heard. And you know the anointing is that those who should be custodians and teachers of the Bible, they are the people who say wrong things. I've heard someone say, hey, grace can save you, you need mercy. Oh. What a crazy statement. What did I call it? What a crazy statement. You know why? For everyone who has believed, the Bible says we have obtained mercy. What did we have? We obtained. We're not looking for it. God's mercy is God's grace. God's grace is God's mercy. For you are saved by grace. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, God who is rich in mercy. So when we want to count God's riches, we count it in mercy. One minute first. I will come back to this place. Ephesians 2 4. Let's see how. Pastor Barry wants to talk now. You hear him. I have this car. I have that car. God has helped me. I have a wife. I have children. I, I, I have a building. I have under this. I have, I, but when God wants to speak, I'm rich in mercy. God's word is measured in mercy. Everybody read, want to go. But God, who is rich? Tap your neighbor. Say, we want to talk about the riches of God. We look at his mercy. And you see, the truth of the matter is God's riches is the forgiveness of sin. For there to be forgiveness of sin, God had mercy on us. So we are not people begging for mercy. We have obtained mercy. Paul said, what I did, I did them ignorantly and I have obtained mercy. I think that's First Timothy chapter 2. Let me check it out. We don't want to just leave any stone turned. Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, verse 15. If you are there, let's just check it out. 1 Timothy, oh, uh, 1 Timothy 2, I beg your pardon. <laughs> 1 Timothy 2, uh, 1 Timothy, thank you. No, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 15. 1 Timothy 1, 15. Watch it, watch it. Join me read. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation. That all of us should accept this thing. That Christ Jesus came into the world. To save who? Why will he kill them? What was his purpose of coming? See, it is what all of us should accept. Now look at it. He said of whom? The man has Chief Tansy Taito in sin. That man you want to kill in your village, he has not even had Boy Scout in sin. This man said Chief Tansy Taito. Give me another rendering of that. And then we will not read the next verse. I want you to understand the justice of God. Look at it. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst. 
But look at the next verse. That's where I'm taking you to. Read the next verse. One to go. But God. So a believer, is he looking for a mercy or is he a recipient of mercy? But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example to this great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Is that okay? Is it clear enough? Look at your neighbor. Just look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, God does not kill Whatever message you heard in the past that God will judge you, he, the death of his son brought the purging of sin to you. No more judgment for you. Who is the first to say amen? Are we, are we communicating today? Now, then we cannot run now. Have you heard this word? Grace and peace be multiplied through what? knowledge. And you see Peter, all his salutation, say grace, peace, mercy, be multiplied. Because you are a recipient of it. It's the motion of righteousness. Because we must let this thing sink. So when you see people you call fathers, they just say, these days, you know, the level we are now, we are saved by grace, we just say, Lord, mercy. And you see congregation in their large number. Yes, sir. God have mercy, Lord have mercy, 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 let Lord have. You just stay and ask, where, what are we living for the next generation? Our children are growing. What gospel will they preach? A gospel of ignorance? A gospel that has no foundation? A gospel that cannot be traced to the scripture? A gospel that is concocted by men? Friends, there is no other foundation that can be laid than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And if there's any foundation you should dip your root into, it must be the foundation of the word of God. Quickly, Psalm 136, and let's quickly do something there. Learning anything this morning? Look at it. In Psalm 136, uh -huh, I'm looking for verse, okay, I'm there, verse 12, verse 12, 13. Let's do something. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endures forever. This man was talking about God's mercy. God's mercy. Look at the next verse. Join me to read. To him. So what divided the mercy? Mercy. Does mercy key? Mercy rejoices over judgment. I hope you know. So God's mercy opened the mercy. Men's unbelief God ran in the mercy. God couldn't have opened the mercy to the children of Israel. And then destroy the children of, uh, the, uh, of Pharaoh. Can I shock you? How many of you also know that some Egyptians followed the Israelites? Yes. Miss multitude followed them. There were those who believed in the God of the Jew. They followed them. Can I even shock you? Moses was raised in the house of Pharaoh. And the Bible says he was well grounded in all the understanding of Egypt. But when Moses came of age, oh, he said, mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 11 again. Let's go and let's just deal with it. As he just said, whom? Let's look for the whom. Yes. Hebrews chapter 11. Glory be to God forever. Oh, come on now. Let's read verse 24 or verse 23. From verse 23. Lenny? By faith, Moses, when he was born, was he three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they, did not, they, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. You read now. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he was, actually he was learned. If you read the book of Acts 7, the Bible says all the wisdom of Egypt was in his hands. He was mighty in words. He was lettered. All right, let's make some. Truth. Choosing rather. So the difference was the faith that he applied. He left the wisdom of Egypt and embraced what we are about to read. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin. For, you read now. That, that will get your attention. 
Say it again. What does it mean to esteem? Regarding to lift, to see above the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasure for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. He was trained there. The difference. The man who led the people to cross the Red Sea, he saw God's mercy and had faith in it. Other Egyptians that went with them saw God's mercy and had faith. But Pharaoh and his people saw God's mercy, walked in unbelief, and they got drowned. God never killed them. We read them here, and we found out it was not. He said, for, by faith, he forsook. Read with me. But by faith, what did he do? Because he was actually primed to be the next Pharaoh. He didn't hear what I was saying. They were training him to be the next Pharaoh. He forsook it. Not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured. Why? And seeing him who is invisible. He was seeing God more than the... Some people just more enjoyment. They don't forget God. See, let me prophesy to every one of you here. Ministry prospers in your life. See, ministry is not only in the pulpit. I hope you know. Where you are, I want you to know that for the fact that you are saved, mean you have been saved to do ministry. That place where you walk, you have been saved to do ministry there. That place where you carry out your transaction, you have been, you have been saved to carry out ministry there. In your neighborhood, you have been saved to carry out ministry. And I prophesy, no matter the gains you have today, it will not make you lose sight of the very essence of your existence. The essence of your existence is to do ministry. And ministry prospers in your hand. That amen is looking for a recharge card. Through faith, he kept the Passover. And the sprinkling of blood. Listen, he that destroyed. Was it God that destroyed? He that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. People were exempted on the grounds of faith. And friends, every one of you here, you have faith. That you are in Christ, you are already in faith. Stop looking for what was never lost. You have faith. And I want you to know that all you need to do as you keep understanding the word of God, you begin to grow in the knowledge of what you have and you start seeing the full manifestation of what already is inside of you. Who is the first to say amen? amen. Let me show you the weakness of God. Talk to your neighbor say the weakness of God. You know God weaknesses to everything. So I want to show you the witness of God to every generation. Acts of the Apostles and chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 8. Please follow me. Our God, our God is a good God. We say it with impetus. With gusto. We say it not being afraid. Because that is who he is. He has never changed. And there sat a certain man at Lystra. Important in his feet. Being crippled from the smallest womb. Who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak. Who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that and perceiving he had faith to be healed. Say unto say with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Paul was just in this. He saw this man was following. And he said, Look, I can see faith. Now stand up. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of the Liconia. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So they came, they almost worship Paul. Please follow me. I know where I'm taking you to. It's not about the healing, but I want to take, take you some. And they called Barnabas, Jupiter. Have you imagined? I, healing takes place in my life now. Me and pa Pastor Barry. And then they say, Papi, we now call you Amadioha. Pastor Barry, <laughs> we'll call you Olokun. That's what they did. Paul made curious because he was a chief speaker. Paul was very vocal. Then the priest of Jupiter that they named them after, which was before their city, brought oxen and gallants onto the gates and would have done sacrifice because that's how they were primed. That's how to worship whoever you see as a god. Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sars, why do you these things? We also are men of great passions with you 
and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven, what again? And all that they are in, good. Now look at the weakness of God. Who in time past suffer all nations to walk? People can do the, anything they like. Nevertheless, in the midst of men walking anyhow, God didn't destroy them. Silas, you didn't hear what I said. In the midst of men walking anyhow, God didn't destroy them. What did God do? Nevertheless, he left not himself without a weakness. So what was the weakness? In that, he did good. Men, stand low. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Men were living anyhow. God did good. If your evil made God to change, it means you can change God. No matter what you do, you cannot change who God is. God is good. These priests, they came with animals to make sacrifice. Now, Paul now started explaining that God cannot be left without a weakness. The number one weakness of God is that he does good. Squeeze somebody's hand. Say, he does good. Everything you call good in your life, God is behind them. Come on, join me. The next thing. And gave rain, us rain. Are you in church? We are talking about the justice of God. Now, all of this were before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. God has been constant. He does good. He gives rain. What again does he do? Who was he addressing? Idol worshippers. Idol worshippers thought, Hey, it is our juju we have been sacrificing to that is making rain to fall. All the good harvest we have been having, it is our juju. The fruitful season is our juju. Paul now said, wait. This God, the way he has shown himself amongst men is this. He does good. He gives rain. He gives fruitful season. Fill it with. Raise your hand and say, this is my God. Come on, you are not doing it. I said, this is my God. Now, this was even before salvation. Before the death of Christ. God does good. Raise up your right hand and say, I receive. All the goodness of God. In my life today. This month, the months to come, the years to come, I'm a recipient of the goodness of God. Look at, you call him a God that kills before I do worship her. Paul says, excuse me, sir. Chere, can I tell you, he cannot be left without the weakness. This is the weakness of God. Even when you didn't know him, he did good. He gave rain. He gave you fruitful season. You plant and you receive. Sister, have you realized that even all the things you plant that you harvest, it is not the sacrifice you made to a deity. It is the goodness of God. The deity, because of ignorance, you are claiming is the one behind it. But you see, even if you claim it was a deity, God was never angry to say, I will kill you. Because death is not in God. Squeeze somebody and say, death is not in my father. Okay, say to your neighbor, now I have so much life. Now I release life into you now. So I extend days for you. I extend weeks for you. I extend months for you. I extend years for you. Also, I extend decades for you. You are so full of life. This is what we have in our Father. Jesus came to give life. And even before his death, burial, and resurrection, the weakness of God is that he does good. And that accounts for why people say, why is it that? Why is it that wicked people don't die? God does not kill wicked people. God will love a man to the point of getting to the gate of hell before God will retreat. But as long as you have breath in your nostril, God loves you. No matter your wickedness, and it's your, our place to share this good news to the world. What did, I, what did I say? It's our place to share this good news. To, next verse. Next verse. Next verse. Ooh. And with these saints, scarce restrain they, the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. They retreated. Say, ah, 
thank God they never quick us do poor libation. Come on, next verse. They never quick us poor libation. For our interna international audience, means that thank God we had not done that. And they came to that setting, Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people. And having stone, huh? there were still people, threw him off the city, supposing he had been, did God see kill them? God didn't kill them. God has no death. Even his son that brought healing, that taught them who God is. Yet, they threw his son, stoned his son by the name of Paul. God did not say, I'll kill you. Paul did not say, I'll kill you. Paul did not say, if I be a man of God. Stephen was being stoned to death. And the Bible says, Stephen looked up. He said, Father, forgive them. Why will he say that? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Why will he say that? He understood the justice of God. Have you even learned anything today? Have you learned anything today? Because we are telling you about the justice of God. God is not a killer. In whom we have redemption. True. What else do we have in that redemption? So forgiveness of sin is the reason we don't kill. You have been forgiven and your duty is to also make people come to the knowledge of that. So the total package of God is the forgiveness of sin. The total package of God is the purging of our sins. I want you to write that down. Total package is not prosperity. Total package is not healing. Total package is not rain. Total package is not the goodness of God. All of these things were before Christ came. But when Christ came, we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Because if you claim that the total package of God is that you have silver and gold, don't forget when Jesus was born, when he had not died for the world, wise men came with frankincense, with gold and myrrh. All of those things, they got it from the earth. They were all demonstrations of the goodness of God. So friends, I want you to know, God's total package is the purging of our sins. Help me ask your neighbor, say, where did that one happen? We'll find that out as we close. Hebrews 9, 12 to 14. I close now. You can see I've covered my Bible. Let me cover this other one. You're smiling. You can't trust me. Have I not tried more than Pastor Barry? How many times did Pastor Barry say finally today when he was teaching? How many of you? Five. Thank God you were counting. <laughs> Pastor Barry, accept this one now. Praise God. Read with me. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. Having obtained. What do you have? Eternal. So nobody can cut your salvation short. Next verse. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an hyphen, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Join me, read 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered without purge? So where was the blood offered? Your conscience. The dead works will be the activities that the Lord gave birth to. So the blood of Jesus was offered in the conscience of men. That is why the blood is not liquid. You can see people cover the chair with the blood of Jesus. I soak this vehicle as you travel in the blood of Jesus. No. The blood was not offered for inanimate things. The blood was offered in the conscience of men. In the hearts of men. Look at it. Pour your conscience from dead works for one purpose. To serve the living God. So say with me, the blood was offered in my conscience. So where did you hear the gospel? He said the Bible says when the gospel is preached in Romans chapter 10, 
He said, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession. So that blood is offered in your conscience with the sole aim of having it purge your conscience from dead works. Squeeze your neighbor's hand. Say, the purging of sin took place in my conscience. And today, I have no evil conscience because the blood of Jesus has been applied in my conscience. Read the next verse if it makes sense. Do you now understand what we have been saying? So the purging of sin take, took place there. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression, that we are under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of what again? You have eternal redemption. You have eternal inheritance. All by the blood of Jesus. Blessed today. And everything that is working against the eternal purpose of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus in your life, we put a stop to it. We speak health and wholeness over your body. We speak over your family that this is a redemption find expression in your family. We speak concerning the works of your hand. We ask that the power of multiplication come upon your hand. Nothing dies in your hand. Nothing dies in your life. You and your family are secured. You and your family, you are in health. I declare today opportunity abound for you. I declare that grace abound for you today. And I declare today that every trap of the devil, you escape those traps. The Bible says, whatsoever is born of God. And I make bold to declare to you, you are born of God. And I call you an overcomer of the world. You overcome the vicissitude of life. You overcome the plot of wickedness. And I speak over you, victory is yours. The blood has been applied upon your life. Celebrate Jesus today.